putting things in the top here, and I can't get to the tab I want. <laughs> um, there we go. Nope. Uh, here we go. This will work. Now, can you see it? Yeah. Yes, we can see your uh, I.O. page. Okay, sweet. So if you click on that link that I just clicked on, you'll come here. And what we'll be using is... We'll be using this, this link right here. So these are the slides I'll be using. And if you want to follow along, there will be the... Um, oh, it's still launching. So if you want to follow along, you can, um, if you've got your orchestra going, you'll have an our studio that you can use. So uh, my name is Jim McDonald. I am a member of Bioconductor and I have a lot of experience with a lot of the annotation packages and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so basically, yeah, it's a, this is a beginner course. So really all we're expecting is you have a basic understanding of our syntax and sort of a basic understanding of the NCBI resources that we'll be using. So NCBI or EBIM. So just the, just the basic idea of how you annotate things is sort of the expectation or understanding what that is. So we'll be using all these bioconductor packages. And when you start your um, orchestra, our studio app, this will automatically, these will all automatically be loaded. So you won't have to worry about that. Um, so the idea of what we're trying to do here is just understand what sort of annotation data are available in bioconductor, understand the difference between some of the annotation sources, um, get a little bit of practice on how to query these annotation packages which it's, it's a little bit complicated for some of these things and get a little bit of practice doing that. Um, so here's the learning objectives, just basically be able to use a bunch of these things. So what do we mean by annotation? The basic idea is here on the left, it's a sort of a functional annotation. You've got the central ID that probably doesn't necessarily mean anything to you. Maybe it's just an ID or something that's like ensemble 003625, not very meaningful. And you might want to be able to say, okay, I've got this ID and I want to know something about it. Like what's the gene ID or what's the gene symbol or what's the protein ID or what's the gene name? So we have this sort of ID to these outer thing mapping, but we can also do the other mapping, which is not an uncommon thing. Like uh, I had a recent data set that I was working on and all of the genes I had were all gene symbols. And so in order to do anything with those data, the first thing I had to do is I had to map those gene symbols to an ID and then that ID onto other annotations. So you can have this um, bi-directional annotation going on. We also have positional annotation, which again, we may have this ID, but then we may want to know something about where is it in the genome? What chromosome is it on? What transcripts does it have? What's the promoter sequence? A lot of things that are sort of genomic based. And we, we can need to do both of those um, depending on the analysis we're doing. So the specific goal that we have is usually we've got some data and you've, the data usually the way it is, is you've got rows or genes and columns or samples, right? And then so we do some statistics. And so each row in this block of statistics, this blue statistics block is like a T statistic and a P value or whatever for each one of these rows of data. So for every gene, we've got a T statistic and a P value saying whether it's different between these groups. And then over here, we may have some annotation information where we say for that gene, here's the gene symbol, here's where it is, here's the go ID, whatever. So we've got this sort of mapping from the data to the statistics to the annotation inf information. Now we could do this with three data frames, right? You, and the only issue with that is then if you try to, if you subset your data, you do anything with your data, you have to remember to do something with your, with your statistics and then something with the annotation information to keep every li everything lined up. 
Another thing we could do is we could put it in a data container like an expression set where this experiment data is the first block over here where you've got, again, samples and columns and genes and rows. And then we've got another data frame that's got the annotation data. And then we've got another thing that's got the sample data. So for each column, we've got some information about the sample, whether it was treated or control or the sex or the age or the weight or whatever kind of information we've got on that sample. And if we put it into something like an expression set, we can then have it encapsulated and have all this information about it. So if you have this um, running in your web browser, you can actually click here to copy things and then paste it into your um, RStudio if you want to like go along with me. But if we load this little fake data that I've got in the package, it'll it'll load this expression set. And then if you just type the name of the expression set, it'll spit out all this information about that expression set. So this expression set's actually got 33,000 rows in it. And instead of doing something like a data frame would do, where it's just gonna keep churning out this row after row after row, it just tells you a bunch of stuff about it. So we've got 33,000 genes, six, samples, the phenodata tells you things about the phenotypic data, the feature data tells you things about the genes. Um, you can put in data about the protocol, about how you treated the samples and things like that. And so it gives you this nice information that tells you everything about your data. And you can extract information about it. It's like we can do this EXPR's argument. We'll get out the, and the, the raw data, which is this, this chunk right here. So we can get the actual data. So this is the values for each one of the genes that we measured. And these are, this is the, the genes are in rows and, and samples are in columns. The phenodata tells us things about the samples. So we know that these were treated with these um, silencing RNAs and these are with scrambles. So we know what the two groups are that we compared. And then this phenodata tells us things about all the genes. Now, the only reason I tell you about these things is because it's a lot easier if you're using that, if you're doing analysis, because a lot of the bioconductor tools expect this is sort of the input. So if you're using Lima to do linear regression or something, if you use this as input, then your output tables would have all this information in it already. And you wouldn't have to do this sort of chasing around of your annotation and your um, all the other data that's appended to your actual raw data. So the nice thing about these bio, bio C containers is you get some validity checking. You get you can subset these things just like it were a data frame. So if you want to say, well, I just want the first couple of rows, it will subset all the data in such a way that you don't get anything mismatched. You can run functions on these um, objects just as if they were a data frame, and a lot of the data will come along with it, um, and you get some automatic behaviors with them. The downside of them is they're a little bit hard to create. You wouldn't want to do it by hand, and it's only useful within R. You can't give one of these things to a collaborator. You have to actually output the data. Um, but anyway, back to annotation. So we have several different types of annotation sources. Um, the first type is, is sort of left over from the microarray days where you could get a bunch of data based on just a chip, like an Affymetrix chip. And so we have some chip DBs that have just information about all the things that were on that Affymetrix chip. At the next level of abstraction, it's the organism level. And we've got basically four different types of things for that. We've got an org DB, which has got functional information in it, like um, the gene ID, the go ID, the keg ID, things like that. We have these positional data um, packages that tell you things about how many exons a gene has, where those exons are, um, what chromosome they're on, that sort of thing. Um, an organism DB is a combination of a couple of these where you can do queries that you do the queries between the databases. So it's, it's like a higher abstraction. It's a little bit easier to do certain queries. Um, the BS genome uh, packages are sequence data. 
So if you get to the point where you need to know, well, what's the promoter sequence in BRCA1 gene, you can use these to get that promoter sequence. Um, we've got a couple other ones. The GoDB does gene ontology mappings. KegDB is actually, I should probably get rid of that. We don't use that anymore. Um, and then we've got a couple annotation, I mean, online resources. So the annotation hub, Biomart, which are things that allow you to query data from online sources. And it's it tends to be a lot more data there. We'll get to all these things. So the main way you interact with any of these annotation um, packages is using a function called select. And the, the form of select is four arguments, the package that you're going to query, the keys that you want to query, which is the IDs that you have, the columns, which is the things that you want to get out of it, and the key type tells the annotation package what type of a key those keys are. Um, and for select, if you are using what the what's known as the central key, you don't have to you don't have to actually say what it is. You can leave it unspecified, but you can always use that. So as a simple example, let's say we want to just get, you know, let's say five IDs. We just sort of randomly select these five IDs that are from this um, Affymetrix array, and we want to get the symbol for all those those genes. So you select, we say the name of the the name of the transcript, the, the database that we're going to query it from, the IDs, which are these five numbers, and then we want symbol. And then it'll tell you that it returned a one-to-one -one mapping between the keys and the columns, and that gives you this data frame that's in the same exact order that you gave it, gave to it. So this is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth thing. And so it's nice if you have uh, an array or whatever you've got ordered call ordered rows of genes if you select you get back the data in the same order so you don't have to worry about whether things got mixed up right so you don't want to have like gene one annotated with gene 32 um, and the nice thing about select is it it returns everything in the correct order so and you can see here it, it just spit out this data frame and you've got the, the original id that we gave and then the symbol that we asked for so Couple of questions. First, how do you even know what the central keys are? So if you decide you want to be with the cool kids and you don't want to specify what the the key was, like what I here I just said simple and I didn't do that last argument. So if it's a chip DB, the central keys are the manufacturer's pro IDs. And since this was an affymetric affymetrics um, chip DB, I knew that and I'm using the pro IDs, I knew that that would work fine. Sometimes it's in the name. So if it's org.hs.eg.db, eg stands for entree gene, which is what NCBI used to call their gene IDs. Now they just call them gene IDs. Um, also, you can just do things like head keys, name of the Anna package, and then that will give you just an example of the IDs for that annotation package. And you can then sort of infer from that. Um, but it's not even necessary to do that. You can always just say it's a probe ID or an entry gene ID or whatever, and it'll it'll give you the right data. So more questions, and these are sort of more pertinent things. What can you even get out of this thing? How do you even know what you can get out of a particular package? So if we use this function key types for this. Um, We use key types for this chip DB, it tells us all of the different keys that we can query on. So most of these are easily identifiable. So entree gene ID, ensemble ID, ensemble protein ID, ensemble transcript ID. So it's pretty easy to infer these things. Symbol, um, some of these other things are maybe not as easy to figure out like alias. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, and then there's a function called columns that will then tell you all of the things that you can get out of the out of the database. So it just so happens that the columns and the keys for this particular package are the same exact thing. So you can map either way. You can do 
um, accession number to go term or go term to accession number. You can either way. So there's one example with select. And the issue with select is if you have one to many mapping. So like if we take these three um, affymetrics IDs and we use so the select function again, we use the IDs and then we say we want the symbol in the map and the map is sort of the karyotype position. We get this thing where it says it returned a one to many mapping between keys and columns. So you can see here we have three IDs and now we've got nine things that it spit back out. So for this first one, we just get one thing. It's, it's traf six and this is where it is. The next seven of these things, it's all the same ID. And it's the same gene family as this DDX11 family. Um, but they're on different places. One's on the P arm of chromosome one, one's on the Q arm of chromosome two, somewhere in the pseudo autosomal region. So that's sort of a problem if we want to have this thing where we have for each row, we have all of the data it's like, remember with our data, we've got samples and columns and genes and rows. If we want to keep the annotation in this row wise fashion, we now have like seven extra rows here for this DDXL, DDX11 gene. To get around that, there's a function called map IDs. And it gives you the control of these duplicate duplicates. So it's got the same arguments as select, only you have to tell it what the key type is. So if we did the same thing as we did above, but said, we just want the symbol and we tell it it's the probe ID. So it's the same ID as we, as we used above. Now we just get a named vector where we've got the probe IDs as the names and the genes as the results. And you'll notice here for this one, this 16657436, this is the one up here that had like a gajillion different symbols. We're only getting one symbol and it's just the very first one. So the default for map IDs is just to give you the very first one, which may or may not be what you want. There are choices for multi valves to for how you can deal with any multiple mappings. So we can say we can use list, character list, filter, as NA or a user specified function. I've actually never used a user specified function, but you could do it, I guess. So if we do the same thing again and we say we want a list, then we get sort of what we'd expect. It's a name list with the IDs as the names and then any duplicated, symbol, duplicated symbols. I don't know what this means. So we end up with this list where we've got all the duplicate IDs for this one probe as you know just one value in this list item. You can also do a character list, and we'll see later on in the presentation how a character list allows you to keep having the, the sort of one row structure with multiple things. So if we did map IDs with character lists, we get this weird looking thing like this, where it's got all of the repeated symbols. If we use filter, it basically just says anything that's got multiples, I'm just going to get rid of. So instead of having three things returned, we only get two. And we can also say as NA, which basically does what you could argue is maybe the right thing to do which is to say it's not available because we don't really know what gene this probe actually measures. I mean, it could measure any one of like seven different things, right? Or six different things. So you could say, well, you know, if it's able to measure like six different things, I, that's the same as not being able to measure anything because I don't know which, what this measure is. So you could use NA2 just to say, look, I don't even know what this thing's doing. Does that all seem pretty clear? So here's a couple questions for you guys to try to see how well this is sinking in. So using either of these, the, the chip 
package that I used above or the org.hs.eg.db package, what's the gene symbol for Entree Gene 1000? Actually, I'm gonna stop sharing that for a second. And I'm gonna share Green one. So you can still see this, right? I hope. You can. Yeah. Can you see the Emacs screen now? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So what's the gene symbol corresponding to Entree Gene ID 1000? So we have... Um, So we want to select from this package and it's Entree Gene 1000. That's another thing I didn't tell you. It's even it's even though it's numeric, it's got to be a character. Um, what did I say I wanted? Gene symbol. So the gene symbol for Entree Gene 1000 is CDH2 straightforward, right? What's the ensemble gene ID for PPR gamma? Um, So this is actually a shortened um, workshop. So I'm gonna just keep going on. These are a couple things that you guys can try to see if you're picking up on this stuff. So the TXDB packages and the ensemble DB packages are, as I said before, this is positional data. And what it contains, you can infer pretty much by the, the package name. So TXDB means it's a transcript database. Then it's the species, the source, the build, and the table. So txdb.hsapiens.ucsc is homo sapiens. It's from UCSC. It's HT19, which is their version of GRCH37. And it's from their known gene table. Same thing with ensemble DV packages. It's, tells you it's an ensemble DV. It's Redis Norvegicus and its ensemble version 79. So these things work very similar to how the orgdb and the chipdb packages work is you can use select on them and you can use uh, map IDs on them. So you could do something like select one in 10 these values and the gene ID from the gene using these are gene IDs. So we want to get the transcript start and in the chromosome. And it'll spit out this data frame that's got the gene ID, the transcript ID, the, the chromosome, the start and the end. Same thing can happen with ensemble DB. You can do the same thing, but that's not really what we would normally do with them. So the nice thing about these is you can just get, instead of asking for, so we did before, as we said, here we got these two genes, give me the information on that. We can do the opposite where we can say, just give me all the information. So here we say, we want all the genes from the TXDB Homo sapiens known gene package. So if you run that, it'll spit out this thing called the G ranges that tells you all this information. So ensemble, G, I mean, entree gene number one is on chromosome 19 from this position to that position on the negative strand, right? And so there's 23,000 of these things here and it gives you this truncated output. And you can you can basically sort this. I mean, you can you could then like subset this on whichever genes you wanted. G ranges list does the. You can also get a G ranges list 
by doing something like this. So if we say we want the transcripts by, and inferred in this is we want it by something. So if we do transcripts by, the default is to do it by gene. So what we're saying is I want all of the transcripts for every single gene. And so it'll make this thing called the G ranges list where this is gene number one and there's two transcripts and this is where they are, chromosome 19 on the negative strand and here's their transcript name. So doing anything more about this is sort of beyond the scope of this workshop, but I had to show you this part because this is very useful for doing annotations and sort of subsetting your data and getting chunks of the data that are that are useful for you. So you can get transcripts, genes, coding sequences, promoters, exons. Um, you can get them all group, grouped by element. So we can do transcripts by and get things grouped by gene or by transcripts. I mean, transcripts by just genes. And... Ah, so you can get it by gene, exon, or CDS. So why would why do we even want these things? Now, the reason we want these things is because it allows us to subset things based on genomic position. So remember, I was talking earlier, you may want to know something about things that are in a gene region. So you may have a bunch of, uh, you may have some evidence that this particular region of the genome is highly differentially methylated between two different groups. Well, the next step, the next thing you might want to know is, well, what genes are even there? What promoters are in that region? How, what's the closest gene to that region? So you need to be able to take and subset data based on position and also get information about what's in that, that region. So one thing we can do is you can subset things using this over function. So up here, what we did is we got this transcripts that's got all of these um, different transcripts for all these different genes. And we also got the genes, right? So we've got two genes here, gene one and gene 10, and we can subset this thing based on the position of those first two genes. So if we do this thing right here, we're just using the regular bracket, like what you'd use with a data frame. So we're taking that transcript uh, G ranges list and we're, we're subsetting it to the things that overlap those first two genes. And so we get the obvious, what you would expect is gene one and gene 10, because that's the first two genes in that list. But we also get this other gene that happens to be in that same genomic region. So we wouldn't have known that, I mean, necessarily, but we wouldn't have known that without doing this, right? So that's just a nice way of being able to say, well, you know, what's in this region? So the use cases for this is looking at gene expression changes near differentially methylated CPG ions. So you could do something where if you've got methylation data and we know, okay, this region of the genome has got differential methylation, what genes are in that region? Maybe you've got gene expression data, what genes are in that region within like a megabase or whatever, and which one of those are differentially expressed? Um, you can look for genes that are near hypersensitivity clusters you can look at the number of CPGs. I mean, just there's lots of use cases for this where you've got sort of this positional information and also genomic information, and you want to be able to subset the one based on the other. Most of the data that's got this positional data would go into a, something called a summarized experiment, where it's similar to the, um, the expression set where we've got information about the samples in one data frame. We've got the experiment data with the same format with the gene, the samples in the columns and the genes in the row. And then our annotation data would include one of these G ranges objects. And then we can subset that based on the other information. So like if we said, I know that there's a differential methylation in this region and I've got this summarized experiment that's got information on the genes that are in that region, then you can just subset out those genes and look at them separately. 
So for the transcripts, how many transcripts does PPR gamma have according to UCSC? So, and then the next one is, does ensemble agree? So this is sort of an interesting thing and something that people don't necessarily expect. So let's take a look at this. Um, so we already know PPR gamma is got this ensemble gene ID, right? So if we also do So we can get the entree gene ID for that as well, right? So then if we do, so if we get the transcripts by, and then we subset that and say, So for this gene, 5468, which we know is PPR gamma, we know that there's 10, 10 transcripts according to UCSC, and this is where they are. They're all on chromosome three um, between, you know, they're all pretty close to each other, right? But if we do, um, all right, sorry, loaded. So we'll just use this version 79. So if we look at the ensemble, so remember UCSC says there's like 10 transcripts for PPR gamma. Ensemble says there's 14 of them. Three of which, so one is this retained intron and two are nonsense mediated decay. So it's a different biotype but still, there's this sort of fundamental disagreement between um, ETC and NCBI and Ensemble as to how many transcripts PPR gamma has. So one of the things that people often try to do is do this mapping where they've got Ensemble IDs and then they want to map them to NCBI, NCBI IDs. And that can be problematic because you can see just right with that, there's fundamental disagreements with a lot of genes between the two annotation services as to how many transcripts there are, where they are, what type of transcript they are. So it's usually not in your best interest to try to do those between annotation service mappings. Instead, it's better just to say, I'm going to either do ensemble or I'm going to do NCBI and just stick with that the whole way through. Um, so I'll leave this one for you guys to do on your own. So we have a new package that um, we built like a couple of releases ago to do orthology. And we're just going to talk about that for just a second. So one thing that you may end up doing is not sort of this mapping where you're doing um, some gene ID to the go terms or the cave terms or things like that. You may actually have this interspecies thing where you say, look, I've got a bunch of mice genes and I want to know what information we have in human for those genes. I want to sort of do this orthology mapping between species. Um, so with this orthology package, you can do that and it uses select just like all these other ones do. 
And so it's just the same thing. So orthology, it's the name of the package. And then here I'm just getting the keys out of the um, human database. So I'm getting here, I'm getting all of the entry gene IDs for uh, homo sapiens. And I'm saying I want zebrafish. So I'm trying to map all of the human gene IDs to zebrafish. And we get like 66,000 mappings, um, a bunch of which are NA. And after we get rid of the ones that didn't map, that came back to there's no mapping, we have about 10,000 genes where we're mapping between human and zebrafish. And if you look at the, the top of this data frame that we got out of it, basically it, you've just got this mapping where we're saying entry gene, I mean, NCBI gene ID 14 maps to this NCBI gene ID. So it just makes it easy to do this sort of mapping between species if you ever run into that situation where you have to do that. There's actually a lot of species in here. There's like almost 370. Oh wait, it's a lot more now. <laughs> so we get this from um, NCBI and I've actually obviously upped it. So there's 452 species in there now and you can sort of, you know, it's all just the species name. So it's species dot genus. And then if there's a, I forget what they call that, but whatever. So if it's like, um, there's the, like different rhinos or whatever, you can find the species that you're looking for and then do, do the mappings that you care to do. So the organism DB packages, one of the things that's hard to do is if you're doing something with a TXDB and you're doing this positional mapping. So you've got the gene ID and you're mapping it to um, how many exons it's got or whatever. You've got this information that's all positional in nature. But if you wanna know but what's the gene symbol or something like that? That's not in that um, transcript database, so it's hard to do that. So if, so if you want to do this cross mapping of positions and functional annotations, it's hard to do. So we've developed these things called organism DB packages, where we've sort of stuck all of these um, databases into one package so you can do these cross database queries. So if you load the Homo sapiens library and then just do the show method, which basically will tell you what's in there, it shows here that it's got the go.db package in it, the org.hs.eg.db package. So we've got the functional data and we've also got this HG19 known gene. One thing about this is the these positional packages are linked to the genome build. So if you're working with HD19 data, then this is what you would want to use. But if you've mapped all your data using HG38, obviously you wouldn't want to use this and so you can update it. So there's a function called um, TXDB where you can basically update it and say that the TXDB is now the HG38. So you can change the DB ob object. The columns and the key types, now if you ask for the columns for this Homo sapiens, you get all of the columns and all of the key types for any one of those databases that are underlying that package. So we can get data out of here. It's like if we wanted to get all of the genes from Homo sapiens and we wanted to get the entree gene ID, the alias and the uniprot ID, we just ask for this columns argument and then when it spits it out, here's all that extra data. So, and it's, this is the same thing that we got above from the TXDB, but now we've got all of the aliases for that, the two Uniprot IDs that map to that. And then we asked for the entree gene ID, which is sort of silly because we already get that. But it's sort of nice because then you can do this thing where you get all of the data, all the annotation, along with the um, with with any of this functional data, you can actually have gene ontology terms here and other things like that. And we were talking above about how the character list is a useful thing, and this is where it comes in comes into play in these um, G ranges objects. You can have so you can see here 
there's at least three um, aliases for this particular gene. And aliases are basically just symbols that are deprecated. So we could have said symbol and it would just be whichever the official current symbol is. So if we use the organism DB, how would we get all of the go terms for BRCA1? So we can do basically the same exact thing that you would have done using just the org dot, um, the org package, but using the homo sapiens. Um, so what gene does the transcript ID this one map to? Now this is sort of tricky because this right here is a transcript name that only comes from UCSC. So UCSC, um, at least up to HD19, gave all of the transcripts these sort of random looking IDs. So if you had the transcript that you got from um, using a TXDB package and you said, well, yeah, but what is this thing? This is how you would do that. So this is something that you couldn't have done using just the TXDB package itself, but using a homo sapiens package, you can then map the transcript name to the entry gene ID to onto the symbol. So how many other transcripts does that gene have? So now we know that it's ZNF23. So we could also do We can also get the entry gene ID. So it's 7571. And then we could do something like um, uh, right. So here's this UC002FA1.3. So if we'd been working with that TXDB, we would know that we'll, we've got all of these transcripts, but we didn't really know, and we could have just mapped this, right? But if we had just the transcript ID, then we, we could have used that with the Homo sapiens package to map it to figure out that it's ZNF23. And any one of these should have mapped back to ZNF23. So we can get all the transcripts from the HG19 genome build, along with our ensemble gene ID, UCSC transcript ID, and gene symbol. So if we do... Let me see. 
ensemble of UCSC and John City Ball. So we just do the transcripts and we ask for these three things, the ensemble, gene ID, the symbol, and the transcript name. And if we do, and so we get this thing where it says select return to one to many mapping. And that one to many mapping is reflected in the transcript name and the ensemble ID and the symbol. So we're getting a list of IDs. So a lot of these are just, just single, but there's obviously some of these where it's multiples. So the one thing with these organism DB packages is they're not simple to put together. And so we've only got three of them that I know we've got um, human, mouse, and rat. So in order to sort of make it easier to have multiples of these things, there's a different type of package called a organism dplyr package. And what this does is it combines the data from the txdb and the orgdb into a local database. And then you can use um, the tidyverse dplyr package to make queries to these underlying databases. So it makes it a little bit easier to put these things together and be able to make a lot of these queries, although you can't do the gene ontology, um, you can't add the gene ontology stuff in there. So it's got the same functions that, you, that we have for the org and the TXDB is key types, select, promoters, exons, everything like that is the same. So you can, you can use these basically the same way. So if we load up the organism dplyr package, normally you would do something like this, where you say source organism is, and you would like do a, an actual txdb. For purposes of this workshop, we're just gonna use this little cut down thing, the hg38 light, which hardly has anything in it, which makes things go a lot faster. So if we do this source organism, and say where the, the thing is and do the show method. It'll tell us that here's where it is. This is the thing that we're querying. And these are the tables in that. So they're a little bit, um, well, they pretty much, the names pretty much tell you what's in it. So it's some ID table. And then it's got like mappings to accessions, to gene ontology, to G go all. The difference between mappings to go and to go all. If you know anything about the gene ontology, it's the directed acyclic graph. And the idea between, the idea with gene ontology is you can have genes that are mapped to a certain gene ontology term. And by definition, anything that's mapped to that term is also mapped to any of the higher level terms as well. So if you if you have a gene that's directly mapped to something like, and here I'm just making something up, but let's say there's a go term called protein phosphorylation, right? Um, that would also be mapped to if it had a parent term of protein modification. So the go all gives you the direct mapping and any sort of any mapping to any higher level go term. So Normally when you're doing like a hypergeometric test, you would use the go all because it gives you all the direct and inferred mappings. Um, the rest of these, protein IDs, transcripts, um, coding sequences, exons, genes, transcripts. So to use this, we can do just like what we've done before. So we can say we want the promoters from that database. And it'll do exactly what you'd expect, which is it puts out a gene ranges object that says, here's all the promoters. It's only 111 ranges, because like I said, it was this little cut, cut down thing. Um, but it gives you, these are all the promoter sequences for all these different genes. So you can, so for this ensemble transcript ID, 
the promoter region is inferred to be in you know, chromosome one in these two positions, I mean, between these two positions on there. Um, so we can, we can do that. We can also look at each one of these data, each one of these tables from the underlying database. So like when we looked here, it listed all these different tables. So we can actually just get those tables and look at them. So if you do this table function and you say you want the ID table, it'll just basically spit out a, just a chunk of that table so you can sort of inspect it and see what's in it. So the ID table, which is sort of the main table, has got the NCBI gene ID, the cytogenic position, the ensemble gene ID, the symbol, the gene name, and then the alias. And interestingly, you can see here, this is basically a fully normalized database table. The only thing different in these first five columns, in these first five rows, is the alias. So like I was saying before, the alias are names that were given, gene symbols that were given to this gene in the past that have been deprecated. So if you work with sort of an old school biologist, they may call A1BG GAB or HIST 2477. So you can run into these situations where you get a bunch of gene symbols from a collaborator and maybe they got those gene symbols from an older paper. That older paper may not call the gene A1BG. It may call it ABG or GAB or HIST 2477. So you can use the mapping, any one of these mappings to go from the alias to the official symbol, and then from the official symbol to the ensemble gene ID or to the entree gene ID. So another thing that you can do with the organism dplyr package is you can make, co make complex queries between tables. So the upside of this is you can do complex queries. The downside is complex queries are complex. So this is all um, dplyr syntax. So an inner join is basically you're saying, give me, link up these two tables. It's like the merge function in base R. So if you say, I want to merge these two, two data frames and merge it on these two columns, it will just give you back the merge data frame where you, both of those columns, there's matching values in, in those two columns you looked at, right? So if you've got one column that's got one through 10 and the other column's got two, four, five, six, and you merge on that, you'll only get the rows with two, four, five, six, right? And so if you do an inner join, it does the same thing. Only here, you don't have to say what you're gonna join on. You just say, I wanna do an inner join on the ID table and the ranges gene table. And what'll happen is it'll tell you as part of the output, what it used to do that inner join. So it turns out that the ID table has an entree gene column and the ranges gene table has an entree gene ID. And what happened is it makes a bigger table that's got, it's merged them based on just that, that entree gene ID. Then you can use these Magritter pipes to filter this bigger table that you've made based on things. So you can filter saying, look, I, I just want the symbol that's either ADA or NAT2. Those are the only two genes I really care about. And then after I do that, I'm going to use this select function from dplyr. And if you're not familiar, if you, this is a fully qualified um, function call. So if you have a select function that's in a package that's higher in the hierarchical order of your packages, and you call that on something and it, so like if dplyr is lower in the, in the package stack than another function, another package that's got a select function in it, you will often get an error. So if we just said select here, it would probably not call dplyr select, it would call a different select version, and then it would give you an error saying, I don't even know what you're trying to get me to do. So if you put dplyr two colons and then select, 
you will get the select function from the dplyr packet. So we put in here dplyr select, and then we say that we want these, what, seven columns. Doing this select presupposes that we already knew what columns were available. So like we did up here for the ID table, we know that there's these um, six columns in the ID table. We could have done the same thing for the ranges gene to know that there's these different things, right? So if we do um, If we do that, then we see that it's got gene chrome, gene start, gene end, gene strand, and entree, right? So when we do that inner join thing, it's going to make a big table that's got all of these columns in there. So we know that we can ask for just any of these names. So once we've done that, this complex query, we end up getting just the um, the gene start, the, the chromosome start, and the strand, and the symbol and the alias, and the map. And again, you can see here, NAT2 has had lots of different aliases in the past. These are all the same exact position, right? These first four things, those, that's all the same exact position. The only reason it's duplicated is because of these aliases. So this first question here is a bit of a trick. And the reason it's a bit of a trick is because I didn't tell you about it. <laughs> so how many supported organisms are implemented in organism.dplyr? So one trick you can do to figure things out if, if you don't know what functions are in a package. So if you use the search function, it'll tell you, this is my package load space. So I know organism dplyr is the fourth thing. So if I do, this tells me all of the functions that are in the dplyr package. And if I look at this and I do supported, supported organisms. So that looks like a thing that we might be able to use. So if we do, it actually works. So supported organisms with no argument tells us there's 21 different um, organisms that are supported. Um, ah, that's a good question, Abby. So when you're making a summarized experiment, It's so like there's two ways you can make a summarized experiment. Um, there's a way where you just like make it by hand, right? So you could just do um, um, so you can just do um, So we can do a summarized experiment and we can say, um, right, so we're gonna put a matrix of data in there, then we can say, um, and then now to put the data in there, we would use this row ranges argument. I don't know if you can see what's in the bottom here, but so there's an argument, which is row ranges, which this isn't gonna work because they, they have to match up. I won't be able to just sort of fake one up because one of the things with the summarized experiment is it's got validity checking. <clears throat> Oh yeah, the TX meta package. <laughs> right. But so you can make them by hand like this, but usually what happens 
is you're going to be using something like DE-seq. So let's say you're doing RNA-seq analysis and you use TXI meta to import your data or even just um, TX import, then you can, as part of DE-seq, you're going to make a summarized experiment and then you can put the data in there as the row ranges. So like, um, Right. So once you've got a summarized experiment, you can add it using the row ranges argument or like mostly what happens is the packages you're using like DEseq will automatically make it for you. And that's usually true of an experiment. Um, it's usually true of all of these bioconductor packages. I mean, these bi bioconductor objects is you usually don't make them yourself because it's tricky because there's this internal validity check where if the rows don't match up. So if the, the idea is that all the, the rows of your data have like gene IDs, let's say, and then the row ranges are going to have gene IDs too. One of the checks that are done is to make sure that all of the rows of your row ranges, the gene IDs match up with the gene IDs of your data matrix. And the same thing is true of all of your phenodata that's um, telling you something about the columns. You have to have rows in there that match up with the column names. And if you're trying to do it by hand and you get one of those things off, it'll say, it'll error on you. It'll say, look, that's not valid, blah, blah, blah. And so usually you use like DEseq or something like that to build it. So how many supported organisms are implemented in organism dplyr? It's 21, right? Hey, Jim, there was a couple other yeah. good questions a little farther up in the chat. Uh, so these chats were just popping up for me, but now let me see if I can, ah, chat. Something. Okay. Oh, wow, there's a gajillion in here. I'm sorry, guys, I didn't, I didn't have this opening. Yuri, did you get my, did you get the package installed? Okay. Okay, Jenny's already been good and answered all these things. Aside from looking up all annotation data packages and bioconductors, there are resource that describes essential annotation databases so that we can easily. Well, we're going to be getting. So, Alex, your question about like finding all the stuff. So, most of the things that I've shown you so far are actually packages that you install, right? So they're installed in your your version of R. Um, we should probably get moving a little bit faster. There's a whole lot more packages that are on this thing called the annotation hub that you have to query and look for. So we'll talk about that in just a second. How to get protein amino acid ranges. Okay, so Yuri, we're going to get to your question in just a second. Because we're going to talk about BS genome packages. So the BS genome packages are basically just the sequences. So, um, and there's a ton of them. So if you load the BS genome package and then look at available genomes, there's a bunch of different packages you can get. And it's basically of the form, the name of BS genome, and then the species. Right, so uh, this is B, NCBI, and the and the B version. 
Um, so what they're good for is the one thing is to get the sequences out. So if we just load one, uh, we'll just do the BS genome HG19 version. And then if you just do the show method, it'll show you all the stuff that's in it. So it tells you it's HG19 and it came from UCSE and it's got all of the sequences. So it's got the, um, like the regular chromosomes and then all these alternate haplotypes and stuff. So the one claim to fame really for the BS genome packages is get seek, which is what you do to get the sequence out of the thing. So if we just say get seek on each, so another thing I didn't talk about. So you get the short name with it, right? So we could have just typed this whole thing, but it gives you this short name. So H sapiens is the short name for the contents of this package. So if we say get seek from the H sapiens package and we say chromosome one, it's gonna spit out a 249 million long DNA string of all of the sequence for chromosome one, which obviously is super boring because the tails are all ends. And I mean, you can't look at that much, right? But we can also use a G ranges object. So this is the thing from genes that we looked at above. This is just a, a chromosome and position G ranges object. And we're saying, give me the sequence for this. So if you had a G ranges that was the promoter sequence for um, a gene or a bunch of genes, if you had a, a genomic ranges, then you can use get seek from the H sapiens and it'll give you all the promoter sequences for all those genes that you put in this gene thing. And it comes in a DNA string set. And you can see these are nice because it's, this is even, this is 85,000 bases long and it gives us dot, dot, dot in the middle. So it's not like blowing some huge thing out, but, and it gives you the, the entree gene ID over here. So, you know, you can get longer, shorter DNA string sets and you can do different things with that that's sort of beyond the scope of this but um if you need to do string stuff if you need to get the sequences this is basically how you do it so all of those things that are installed uh the dna sequences that vary between the individuals so we are just we are just packaging data that comes from online sources. So May Woods asked what happens with DNA sequences that vary between individuals. So this is the reference genome. So the reference genome doesn't vary between anybody. You can also, I guess I'm skipping over the fact that we do have SNP data as well, where you can get for each position what different what are the different variants that, that are known to be there and what's the minor allele frequency? So there's that as well, but this is just the reference and I don't know how they decide what it, what's the reference. Um, yeah, so it's just the reference sequence. There's no, there's no variability in it. So Annotation Hub is an online resource that has, um, so if we just load the library, the annotation hub library, and then get a hub by doing this, this annotation hub with no arguments, it will download a bunch of data. It'll populate a little database that tells you all the stuff that's in there. And then if you do the show method, it'll tell you there's like 65,000 of these things. There's like a li literally a gajillion of these. And it gives you a little bit of information about it, data providers, so you can see, lots of different places, lots of different species, lots of different types of data, um, taxonomy IDs, genome description. There's, there's just tons and tons and tons of data here. So 65,000 things, it's kind of hard to, the trick here is kind of like when you're trying to figure something out and you're using Google. The best way to do things is to do a good query. And the best queries are based on the data provider, the data class, the species, and the data source. So if we do this M calls on the hub, it'll tell us what all of these, um, so it's basically a big data frame. And for each, for each column, it 
for each different thing you can get, there's a title, where it came from, what the species is, the tax ID, the genome, all this information. So we can then look at each one of these columns to see what sort of stuff is in there. So if we look at the unique values of data provider, you can see a gajillion different things, right? The big ones would be like UCSC Ensemble in Paranoid. But I mean, if you're working with non-model species or things like that, you can see there's a lot of stuff on the DB SNP. There's, I mean, what the unique, there's 73 unique types of things that are in there. The data class tells you what sort of data they are. And so a lot of these are obvious, like a G ranges, we already talked about that, you know what that is. Um, a two bit file is a binary sequence. So if you wanted to get basically a genome sequence for something that they don't, we don't have an actual package for, you could probably get a two bit file for it and turn that into a BS genome package or just actually query it as if it were. Um, but you can see there's lots of different file types here. Um, lots of different species. There's like 28, 22 species that are, that have data on here. And um, the source type is, this is a little bit more helpful for some of it, like in paranoid is, a, is homology mapping. UCSC track is gonna be mostly um, information coming from the UCSC genome browser, well, obviously. So ensemble IDs from NCBI, Unipro from NCBI. Um, yeah, like I said, there's a lot of stuff here. So if you wanted to do a query, you use the function query, use, you know, we have this thing called hub that you're gonna query on. And then we're gonna ask for three things. We want a G ranges object. We want it to be homo sapiens and we want it to be ensemble. Okay. And none of this is unlike most of our, it's not um, case sensitive. So you don't have to capitalize it correctly or anything like that. You just type it in all lowercase and we'll figure it out. So if we do that, query for human G ranges objects from ensemble, we get 109 of these things. And if you look at them, it just gives you this little truncated thing where it shows you the first five and the last five, which is useful in as much as it didn't put 190, 109 things there that you can't really see, but it's not useful in as much as there's a lot of things in between that and that that you don't get to see. So one thing that I do sometimes is if I get something like this where there's a gajillion things is I look at the source URL. So if I do query and dollar sign source URL, it pulls out the, that one column of where it came from. As you can see here, we've got 109 things. When I first put this, this workshop, there weren't, <laughs> there weren't 109 things. So it wasn't stupid to print all this out, but now there are, and it's kind of stupid. So anyway, but you can see at the beginning here, we start out and we've got um, these first five things that all comes from UCSE. And you know that because it says UCSE in the name. Then the rest of this, it's all mostly just ensemble. And so this is ensemble GRCH 37 release 70. So ensemble has got release after release after release after release. So you can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven G ranges for um, GRCH37 for all of these different um, releases. And then we go to GRCH38, and then there's a bunch more releases and it keeps going up and up and up and up and up. The only thing that's changing here mostly is that there's, you know, this is a different sort of GTF, but mostly it's just all the genes for these different builds. So what I decided is I'm gonna get this one mainly because I was having problems with it. I wouldn't download this one yesterday. So what I want is query and I sub, I do this thing. And so it told you to do that up here. So this is that AH thing. And it says right here, retrieve records with object AH whatever, right? So that's what I'm gonna do. 
So down here, what I want is the query, and I'm going to do double bracket and in quotes that AH 98495. And what it'll do is it'll download that um, GRC, this GTF from Ensemble, and then I'll have a GRanges object. And the problem with this G-Ranges object is it's got a lot of information about exons and CDSs and things like that. And so it's not super useful the way it is. But what you can do is use this function, make TXDB from G-Ranges, and it'll turn it into a TXDB, which we already know how to do things with. So we do that, and it makes a TXDB object that's got um, like 244,000 transcripts. And it you know, just gives you all this information about it. Um, so, questions, how many resources are on Annotation Hub for Atlantic Salmon? So, we sort of already know how to do that, right? So we do, um, what did I say? My resources. So we just query on that species, and there's like 64 things here. And these are different things. So like this ab initio GTF is, I have to go and look. Um, it's a special kind of GTF. So this, this one right here is just like the regular one. It's like all the genes. And this ab initio, I think, has got more genes or something. But anyway, so you can look at these things and say, you know, so like here, this is an ensemble on ENSDB. So you can get that and you already know what that's going to be. Um, there's a version 106 GTF. There's this CD, CDNA all two bit. So this right here is going to be um, sequences for all the transcripts. And then it's going to have this non coding thing. So it's going to have all the sequences for the non-coding um, genes. So I mean, it's pretty cool. There's lots of stuff there. It's a little bit tricky to sort of find things and it's a little tricky to figure out what's there. But usually if you're working with non-model organisms, especially, there's a lot of data there that you can get that would be sort of hard to get otherwise. And it's nicely packaged for you. Um, so give the most recent ensemble build for domesticated dog and make a TXDB. Well, I already showed you how to do that for, for human. So, you know, at your leisure, go ahead and try that. So the last thing we're going to talk about is the Biomart package. So what the Biomart package does is it allows you to query the ensemble data. So everything we've talked about so far is mostly NCBI based. Um, except for the Ensemble DB packages. But most of this is either UCSC um, sequences and positions or NCBI gene ID mappings. But if you've got Ensemble gene IDs and you want to, want to map those to gene names or symbols or whatever, you wouldn't want to use like an org.hs.eg.db package because that's based on entry on, on gene IDs. You'd instead want to use BioMart. And the way it works is First, you load the package, and then you can list the marts to see all the things that are available. Use this list marts function. But the way it works is you first um, use the use ensemble function to make what they call a mart. And the mart is just basically a connection to the to their database. And then you can list all the data sets that are available. So there's a gajillion of them, so but you can list them and see, oh, look, I work with Eastern Happy, so I want to get this particular one, or I'm, I'm a Golden Eagle person, I'm going to use this one, whatever. Um, but we're going to just do something simple and trivial, which is to use Homo sapiens. So to set up a mark to use Homo sapiens IDs, we would use use ensemble. The first argument is ensemble. The second one is H sapiens underscore gene ensemble. And I don't know why there's this huge gap there, but pretend it's not. And then when we make a query, it's we use a function called get BM, and it's got four arguments: attributes, filters, values, and marked. The attributes are the things that we want to get. 
the filters are the types of IDs that we've got that we're going to give to the bioart. The values are the actual things that, so the filters are the type of thing and the values are the actual values. Like if we, if we say we're going to give it ensemble gene IDs, the filter would be ensemble gene ID and the values would just be a character vector of ensemble gene IDs. And then the mart is just the mart that we're going to query. So as far as the attributes and filters, a lot of them are kind of, um, they're inscrutable. So you have to know what they are. So you can use list attributes and list filters to get this list of all the different choices. So like if you have ensemble genes, it's ensemble underscore gene underscore ID. So that's that would be your filter or your attribute. If you have ensemble gene IDs that are like ENSG long number dot one or dot five or whatever, that's a gene ID with a version. So you would have to use ensemble gene ID version, right? So this list attributes and list mark tells you basically all of the things that you give as attributes or as filters. So if we just wanted to do a really simple example query, here's just like four FEIDs that I chose. And we're going to say, we want to get the HGNC symbol, which is just the, basically the, the gene symbol. Um, and we're going to tell BioMart that these are FE HGU95 AV2 um, gene symbols. And FEIDs are the things that we're going to give it. And then we already set up the mark. So one th two things to note here. First thing, the attribute, so the filter is FE underscore HT underscore U95 AV2. Uh oh, Jenny's got a hack. That's not such a bad idea. Um, so the trick here, so you look at this, this filter and this attribute are the same thing. It's the FE HGU 95AB2. Oh, wait, no, they're identical. Never mind. Sometimes they're different. The other thing that's a trick with this is you're querying a database. And a database, there's no guarantee in the order that things are returned to you. So whenever you use Biomart, always put in the attributes things that you're going to get back, the same thing that you're using as a filter. Because you can see here, so we did this, get the M, and we asked for the attribute back, the symbol, and we said it was FEIDs. You look at this, so the order here was 1,000, 1,001, 1,002, 1,007. What we got back was 1,000, 1,007, 1,001, and two 1,002s. So the order on this is never guaranteed to be the same as what you gave it unlike select and all these other functions that we looked at before. So you always have to give it this thing so you can then filter. And then of course you'd want to get rid of this duplicate here, but then you'd want to use like merge or um, match to reorder this to where it's in the same order as the data that you originally started with, right? So you'd want to match this column to those FEIDs to reorder it. And we're about out of time. So the biomart exercises here are relatively simple. You can go ahead and try those. Um, I'll be around. So if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, there's a, on the main website, there's a, what do they call it? It's the meet people or something, connections. It's so like you can send me a connection, whatever, and ask me a question. We can do that. Um, or you can ask questions on the support site. I'm usually on there and answering questions. So does anybody have any other questions for now?
You can use select with Biomart? I did not know that. Is that new, Jenny? Yeah, um, I think it's at the bottom of their vignette that they added that in, but you still need to do their attributes. Like you have to put it both in as a filter and an attribute to get it back out. Right, oh, so, right. So if you, so their select is doing what select does. Normally it, it reorders to make sure that the order stays the same. Um, I don't know if the select reorders, but I just know that you don't have to. I switched over to teaching that, oh, look, you use it with select and columns and key types and everything instead of the get VM. I think it's at the bottom of the Biomart vignette that they put that functionality in. So so if we do The other issue with Biomart and with the Annotation Hub is it's online data and being online, sometimes you can't access it. So like you'll do what I'm doing right now and you can see it's taking forever. Sometimes what'll happen is it'll try different mirrors and sometimes it'll like, I get it. Sometimes it'll just take forever and sometimes it'll just say, yeah, I couldn't do it. And if it does that, oftentimes you just have to go back again, try again. Yeah, you can see what's happening here. So it's trying US West, it's probably gonna try US East. There we go. Okay, so what is it? It's the same. It's just like that, Jenny? Mm, I forget off the top of my head. I'll have to look it up. If anybody's interested, you can, I'm not sure if we can share things for everybody outside, because I know workshop people are gonna have to start moving to the next one. Anybody in here, any yeah. questions? Okay, well, I will share this with Jim and maybe next year he'll put it in to change it. But otherwise, uh, let's thank Jim very much for the workshop and uh, we'll see everybody at the rest of the conference. Bye. Thanks for coming. Hope it was helpful. See you, Jenny. <laughs>